An immediate suit was filed by Democrats, and rebuttal came from John Mitchell, by then chairman of the committee to re-elect the president. The lawsuit filed today by the chairman of the Democratic National Committee represents another example of sheer demagoguery on the part of Mr. O'Brien. This committee did not authorize and does not condone the alleged actions of the five men apprehended Saturday morning. We abhor such activity. The Committee for the Re-Election of the President is not legally, morally, or ethically accountable for actions taken by individuals without its knowledge and beyond the scope of its control. In light of the thorough investigation which is underway and the readiness of the U.S. Attorney to proceed as evidence is developed, the lawsuit filed by Mr. O'Brien cannot be regarded as anything other than a political stunt. When the hearings began in October, the Washington Post gave the whole affair detailed coverage, eliciting this statement from Clark McGregor, Republican campaign chairman. Using innuendo, third-person hearsay, unsubstantiated charges, anonymous sources, and huge scare headlines, the Post has maliciously sought to give the appearance of a direct connection between the White House and the Watergate, a charge which the Post knows, and half a dozen investigations have found, to be false. Unproven charges by McGovern aides or Senator Muskie about alleged campaign disruptions that occurred more than six months ago are invariably given treatment normally accorded declarations of war. Senator McGovern made it a campaign issue, as did all Democrats. The men who have collected millions in secret money, who have passed out special favors, who have ordered political sabotage, who have invaded our offices in the dead of night. All of these men work for Mr. Nixon. Most of them he hired himself, and their power comes from him alone. They act on his behalf. They accept his orders. Yet Mr. Nixon has even promoted some of the officials implicated in these scandals, and he has blocked any independent investigation. He refuses to answer questions either from the press or from the people. He stays hidden in the White House, hoping you will mistake silence for innocence. At election time, a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing was shaping up that promised some lively headlines in 1973. Meanwhile, Governor John Connolly, chairman of the Democrats for Nixon, tried to bring reconciliation. Jealous husbands and wives are bugging each other, and there are too many private detectives with too many strict, uh, sophisticated surveillance equipment. Uh, business associates and business concerns bug each other. There's too much bugging in political campaigns, and I don't condone any of it. I condemn it, and I think it ought to stop. Another feature of 1972 was a spectacular hijacking series, a one-day strike of airline pilots, and high-level conferences on hijack prevention said General Benjamin Davis, Assistant Secretary of Transportation for Safety, We must instill in all parties, airport operators, airline management, and flight crews, an increasing determination to resist hijack and extortion demands to the fullest extent possible, consistent with the safety of any human lives that are involved. Too often, Hijackers have been afforded service and responsiveness that's not provided even the first-class traveler. Prisoners of war made news. On September 3rd, three rather confused POWs were released by Hanoi into the waiting arms of relatives and a peace committee. En route to Hanoi via Bangkok, Mrs. Minnie Lee Gartley was approached by newsmen about her son, Mark. I suppose, you know, you think, uh, is this... Uh... Wonderland, is it all true, or is it like Alice in Wonderland? And really not until we landed in Bangkok and I looked and my feet were on the ground and I realized I was here. I think for the first time I realized it is all true. Shocker of the year was the horrifying drama at the Olympic Games in Munich in September when a masked band of Arab terrorists entered the Israeli quarters of Olympic Village and gunned down two men, took nine hostages, and fled to a nearby airport. All the hostages and five Arabs died in the shootout. The games hung in the balance until President of the IOC, Avery Brundage, made this proclamation. We declare today a day of mourning, a 
and will continue all the events one day later than originally scheduled. If Indonesia and the Middle East were trouble spots, Bangladesh was not far behind. Early in the year, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, returning to his new nation from captivity, spoke defiantly. You know all the history of what has happened in Bengal. I think if Hitler could have been alive today, he could have been ashamed. I welcome foreign aid for all countries of the world to rehabilitate my people. But it does not, it does not mean that anybody want to impose something on us and will accept it. My millions of people have died, many can die, but I am not going to lose my freedom any, again anymore. Throughout the year, Bangladesh teetered on the edge of famine and collapse. Sporadic but bloody fighting continued in Northern Ireland throughout the year. After a melee in Derry in which 13 people died, Jack Lynch, Prime Minister of Southern Ireland, spoke out. We consider that it must be now clear to the British government that their policies in Northern Ireland are misguided. What is now required are the immediate withdrawal of British troops from Derry and Catholic ghettos elsewhere, and the cessation of harassment of the minority population, the end of internment without trial, a declaration of Britain's intention to achieve a final settlement of the Irish question, and a convocation of a conference for that purpose. Brian Faulkner, Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, replied. Today, when it is clear that a campaign to achieve a united Ireland without our consent is being mounted both by parties in Northern Ireland and by the government of Mr. Lynch, it is right that I should sound a most solemn note of warning. The Unionist community in Northern Ireland will not tolerate such a proposition. And Edward Heath, British Prime Minister, tried very hard to achieve reconciliation. There will be no let up in the fight against terrorism. All the security forces will continue to have our full backing and support. I want to say a special word to those of you who live in Northern Ireland. You are the ones who have had to endure the years of violence and fear. We admire the steadiness and courage with which you have done this. Now, only you can take the decision to live together in peace. But by the year's end, peace had not come to Ulster. At home, U.S. district attorneys failed to win their cases in two important trials. The Harrisburg Seven, including Father Philip Berrigan, were accused of conspiracy to kidnap officials, burn draft records, and commit acts of violence but a jury found the seven guilty only of smuggling letters out of prison. Father Daniel Berrigan, brother of the defendant, commented, Both he and I can testify that from our own prison experience, hundreds of letters are passed every day of the week. Drugs are passed, money is passed, and no indictments ever ensue. So both the tone and the content of this letter, it seems to me, highlight in a very alarming fashion the selective nature of the indictment Another of the group was Sister Elizabeth McAllister. The rejoicing that is manifest among us at this point is something that does not hide our awareness of the shoddiness that we have seen in this courtroom through the whole process. It does point up the fact that a jury is often more just, even a hung jury, than either the judge or the Justice Department. And that shows us that perhaps the work before us is to put more and more authority into the hands of people. People frequently have a greater sense of decency than those in power. And they have a sense of refusal to buy the government's paranoia, particularly with regard to conspiracy. On June 5th, Angela Davis was acquitted and immediately traveled to the Soviet Union on a triumphant tour. But while still in prison, she was allowed an interview with her minister, which was taped for broadcast. A lot of people somehow have the feeling that the movement is um, collapsing. But I think that what is happening is that the idea that a few people have been expressing for a long time are penetrating to the masses of people. And you have uh, um, sisters and brothers who are, say, five, six years old who know of what has to be done. During the year, death claimed the King of Denmark, the Duke of Windsor, Walter Winchell, Mahalia Jackson, Ezra Pound, 
Adam Clayton Powell and Jackie Robinson, the first black player in Major League Baseball and a respected community leader in recent years. The Reverend Jesse Jackson spoke at his funeral. In this last dash, Jackie stole home. Pain, misery, and travail have lost. Jackie is saved. His enemies can leave him alone. His body will rest, but his spirit and his mind and his impact are perpetual and as affixed to human progress as are the stars in the heaven, the shine in the sun and the glow in the moon. Another loss of 1972 was J. Edgar Hoover. One of his admirers commented, For 25 years from the time I came to Washington,